o'clock uh, at, uh, at central time, uh, central uh, Eastern East or Central European time. So, um, um, but uh, welcome to the session. Uh, we're going to start in a, in, a, in a few minutes time, um, but it's, uh, it's good to see some familiar names out of, out, of it, out of here, some names of people who've already been to, the, um, to this webinar series before. Um, and also a bunch of people I recognize as a good contingent here from Australia. Um, I've seen uh, Paul, um, uh, including Gemma from your own uh, from your own unit. So I'm sure sure you'll be pleased that Gemma that Gemma is there, um, as well as I recognize uh, Dan Jenkins has uh, has also ma managed to make an appearance for this one. So so welcome welcome to you all. Um, we're just taking a few a few minutes just while people join because this, the webinar was uh, was due to start at um, at ten o'clock Central European time. Um, I see some of you are greeting each other in the in the chat function. That's uh, that's great. Please go ahead and feel free to do that. Um, just to quickly introduce myself while people join, because you want to hear more about Paul than you want to hear about me. Um, I'm Andrew Thatcher. I'm the chair of the International Ergonomics Association's Task Force on the Future of Work. And this uh, webinar here is presented as part of our webinar series on the future of work. So far, we've been, been hearing about what the future of work is from various different places around the world. Um, so we've heard from Australia and New Zealand, from China, uh, from uh, Southeast Asia, from Central Europe, from Northern Europe and from Africa. Um, and coming up, we have presentations from the UK, from South Korea and Central, sorry, South America, Central America and, um, and the United States before the end of this year. Um, so uh, those are all available, including this session, uh, this webinar after, after today's session on the IEA's YouTube channel. Uh, if you don't know what the IEA YouTube channel is, I will post that in the chat so you can, so during the course of, um, of Paul's presentation, of which I'll be writing copious notes about, um, you'll be able to, to go and have a look and see what the other webinars are in this webinar series. All right, I think we've got, uh, we've got 50 odd people joining, joining now and I don't want to use up any more of, of your valuable time, so thank you everyone for, who's able to make it here. As I said, again, we'll have a recording of this, so you'll be able to go out there and, uh, and listen to the recording. Um, so you'll be able to see Paul. Um, I realize that in Australia, there actually are two Paul Salmons. Uh, the one's uh, uh, an Aussie Rules football player. This is the other one. Uh, this is the non-Aussie Rules football player. This is Paul Salmon, who is a professor of human factors at the University of the Sunshine Coast, one of my favorite names for a university. Uh, where he is also the director of the Center for Human Factors and Socio-Technical Systems. Um, at least I think you're still director, Paul. Um, you've, uh, I think you're co-director. Paul director. director. Well. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, Paul is a prolific researcher. Uh, he's got more than, uh, I think it's 250 uh, journal, peer-reviewed journal publications to date and, and 22 books on a range of different topics from uh, systems methods for human factors all the way through to issues around uh, transportation, um, safety, and issues around uh, artificial intelligence. And that's really what we're here to, to listen to about today. So without further ado, I'm going to switch my mic off and, uh, and hand over to Paul. Uh, we'll try to keep this to around about 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes, and then to leave some time for questions. If you have any questions, I'd really appreciate if you use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. Um, that'll uh, help me in, in, in monitoring a single channel rather than having to monitor, monitor two channels. So Paul, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. And hopefully everybody can see my slides. Um, uh, yeah, and, and yeah, that's right. I'm now the, the core director of the center and Gemma Reed is the, the other core director. And that's probably why she's here. She's here to check up on me and make sure I don't say anything uh, too outrageous. Um, so I just want to say thanks of all. Thanks, first of all, to, for, to Andrew and the team for inviting me to come and present. Really appreciate it. Um, it's going to be fun. 
Um, and also, as Andrew said, it's recorded. So I will say that these are my opinions only and, and not those of the organization who employs me. I can often get into trouble. And it can be a bit of a rant when it's about AI, as, as many of you who've seen me talk about it before can attest to. Um, so I'll get going. Um, and so you'll see the title. I've changed the title a little bit. I thought it'd be a bit controversial. Um, so Phil's rushing where angels fear to tread, you know, this idea that you know, people with not enough knowledge are going into a space where people with a lot of knowledge don't want to go into. Um, actually, interestingly, it's from uh, Alexander Pope, uh, and it's from a poem called An Essay on Criticism, which in the same poem I only found out today comes the, the kind of phrase to err is human, which is another really popular kind of HF phrase. So hopefully this one catches on as much as it does as, as the last one does. Um, but that's the title anyway. And really what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about you know, the proliferation of AI, um, what it means for the future of work, and then really about um, what what some of the problems around that are. So what, it, what, is, what can we learn from kind of past insertion of technology into systems? Uh, how should we be inserting AI into our current systems? What are some of the risks? And then tell you about some of the work that we've been doing in, in this space. So hopefully you find it interesting and yeah, definitely looking forward to questions. Um, so, so I'll get into it without further ado. Uh, and so the background that I think we're all familiar with is that, you know, AI is increasingly being implemented in many areas. It's actually becoming ubiquitous in, in daily life. Um, and there's been lots and lots of discussions around, you know, the various and very diverse set of risks that are associated with that across many domains, whether it's defense about autonomous weapons uh, or whether it's about, um, you know, things like workplace safety for AI and so on and so forth. Lots of discussion, lots of literature out there, and some of the references are up on the slide. Um, and also around that discussion, there's been lots of people who've been kind of pointing out that, well, you know, as the science of kind of human health and well-being, human factors and ergonomics should really be playing a strong role in ensuring that we can create safe, ethical, and usable AI. And, you know, various people have been saying that. Um, whether we're kind of achieving that or not is a question in one of the threads through the presentation. And then another thread through the presentation, I think, is that really we're kind of coming close to the next really advanced form of AI, which is artificial general intelligence, which I'll talk about um, kind of halfway through the presentation. And that really raises the stakes a little bit when we talk about the replacement of human work and some of the risks that can arise from that. And so I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, and so the focus of the presentation is, you know, about this idea that AI is replacing human work all over the place. And you can, if you go on Google and you type that in, you get all sorts of crazy images. This is one I like. So it's the famous lunch atop a skyscraper picture, but it's where the workers are all replaced with robots. But you can kind of get us get these images from all from all sorts of places. If you look at the literature, and there's been lots of kind of reports done around this, and um, there's kind of some kind of startling figures. So up on the slide there, we've got 47% of total US employment at risk. Uh, two thirds of US and European occupations are exposed to some degree of automation by AI. Uh, the WHO World, uh, the, sorry, the World Economic Forum that should be did a report and where they suggested uh, 85 million jobs will repl be replaced by 2025. Though they did acknowledge that 97 million will be created as well through AI. Um, but I guess there's a question about what the, the kind of shift in that work actually is. And then Ben Goetzel, who's a kind of big name in, in artificial general intelligence, suggests that AI could replace 80% of jobs in the next few years. So there's, there's lots of kind of interesting concern about this. If we look at what some of those jobs that are under threat are, there's an interesting paper from Felton and colleagues who basically did a study um, a couple of years ago, and then they've kind of refreshed the study based on ChatGPT. And they talk about the top 20 occupations that are under threat from the insertion of AI, basically. And you can see I won't go through them on the slide there, but there's all sorts of interesting occupations that are under threat more recently with ChatGPT kind of teaching occupations, which is interesting. Um, and then they also talk about the kind of industries that are exposed uh, to kind of replacement from AI. And again, I won't talk you through that, but lots of very different, very diverse industries that are all under threat from um, humans being replaced by AI. So it's really quite interesting. It's obviously a source of concern. Um, but, but what is that concern? So what is the problem? So, you know, there's, there's, there's some people out there kind of say, well, this is brilliant. You know, we can, um, you know, reduce workload on humans. They can do more things around leisure time. 
and so on and so forth. Well, there's a number of concerns, I think, around, um, you know, how it's being done, basically. How, how is this insertion of AI being done? How are these systems being designed? How are we managing their insertion into our systems? How are we managing the replacement of human work? And actually, um, if you look at some of the kind of seminal human factors work, they kind of suggest this is not a really good idea. Uh, and so the first area, obviously, is socio-technical systems theory, which most of you will know about. It was developed at the Tavistock Institute by you know, Emery and Trist in the 1950s. And this was actually developed as a response to the insertion of what they call increasingly disruptive technologies at the time. It was the long wall, long wall coal mining method. Um, and you know, it's, it's basically um, a system design approach that's underpinned by notions of industrial democracy, participatory design, humanistic values, and the, this idea of meaningful work, which is really critical when we're talking about inserting AI into these systems and removing human work. You know, what happens to the, the leftover work? Is that meaningful for humans or are actually taking some of that meaning away? And one of the kind of central tenets of STS theory is this idea of adaptive capacity, so systems that can respond to external disturbances and changes in the environment. Um, but the key to, to achieve that is that you jointly optimize the human and the technical components of the system. And there's a bit of a question around AI and the future of human work about whether we're actually even trying joint optimization or joint optimization or whether we're simply replacing humans. Uh, and so SCS proposes a set of kind of principles, um, design values and principles that are really quite interesting when we think about AI replacing human work. And so this is a diagram from some of Gemma's PhD work, and I'll, I'll skip through it. And what you can see here are a set of kind of core values around the outside of the diagram, which are the, the blue arrows, and then some design process principles and values uh, in, the, in getting towards the middle of the diagram. So if we just look at the outside of that um, diagram, uh, you can see that, that some of the values, humans as assets, so this idea that we need to support humans to make their own decisions, support flexibility, performance, variability. Technology is a tool to assist humans, not replace humans. So this idea that we match any new advanced technologies to human needs, that technologies fit the user's goals, tasks, and ways of working. Promotion of quality of life, so the users, the humans have a, a reasonable challenge in their work. They have control over decisions affected them. There's opportunities to learn, social interaction. Um, respect for individual differences, you know, the needs of different users are considered and balanced, design is flexible, individuals can tailor their interaction as they prefer, and then responsibility to all stakeholders, so there's no unjust negative consequences to different stakeholders in the system. Already, and we're only on the outside of the diagram, you can see that AI and replacing forms of human work is kind of flouting a number of those values. And if you look across the middle of the diagram, you'll see that there are some of the others. So things like tasks are allocated appropriately between and amongst humans and technology. And we need to we need to actually do some deep analysis to understand what that appropriate allocation is. It's what we do as HF people. Um, useful, meaningful, and whole tasks are designed. And so there's a question here about whether, and I think the answer is no, um, inserting AI in this in, into human work and replacing human work actually aligns with SDS principles. I don't think it does particularly well. And we'll return to this a little bit later. Um, the next kind of bit of seminal work that, that really kind of raises some issues with this idea of AI replacing human work is the ironies of automation by uh, Lizanne Bainbridge in 1983. So, you know, such an old paper now, but such so still highly relevant to everything that we're talking about in contemporary society today about AI. So this idea that there's an automation paradox, it's still a human machine system. All we're really doing is replacing human errors with designer errors. Um, the more advanced control we use, the more critical humans actually become. We can't just take them out of the system. The humans still have to do the tasks left over that the AI isn't doing. Um, you still need highly skilled operators when the AI fails and it will fail and it does fail. Um, humans are terrible at monitoring you know, non-human systems. We're, we're expected to do this when we insert AI into systems, but we're not very good at that at all. Um, we have situation awareness decrements between the humans and the AI, and you know, we don't have distributed situation awareness. Our health and well-being suffers because our work isn't so meaningful. We're questioning our purpose. Uh, and even the best automated systems require the greatest investment in training. And really, these, <laughs> these are well-proven 
ironies over years of research and nobody um, in the kind of development of AI or the organizations using AI are listening to them, which is really quite frightening. And we can look um, across many kind of examples that people have seen me talk about Fabio before, the robot that was a supermarket assistant uh, introduced into a supermarket chain in Scotland, promptly fired after about a week because it was a little bit strange. It, you know, it wasn't particularly helpful. It would tell when customers asked it where the wine were, it would say it's in the wine aisle. Uh, it would tell customers they look really nice today. So it was a bit creepy and um, fired after, you know, a week of work. Um, we, we, we promised, you know, Robocop. Um, we get these things, uh, these police bots. Uh, and again, lots of issues that show clearly they haven't been designed with a kind of HFE considerations about how they interact with people, how they understand what's going on uh, in the world. Uh, you had the famous Amazon uh, AI recruitment tool that was showed, you know, strong bias against women. And this was around the training data set that it used. So, you know, they developed a quite a quite an, a, a useful AI system, but they trained it on the last 10 years of applications to their own company, which were dominated by men, which meant that the AI was then, you know, discriminatory, biased against women, basically. So, again, another kind of badly designed AI. And um, more on a more serious note, uh, we're talking about lives lost. So the Boeing 737 Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System or the MCAS system uh, was basically a computer AI, basically uh, AI based stability system, which would kind of control and stabilize the, the new plane because of some design flaws. Obviously we had two uh, major incidents with this uh, system, the Ethiopia Airlines flight and the Lion Air flight. And you literally had a battle between the human operators and the automation here in terms of trying to fly the plane and keep it level and safe. Um, and all sorts of systemic issues around this, around you know how the how this automation was in, implemented in the system, who knew about it, whether the humans in the system were trained to work with it or not, and, and lots of really interesting um, flaws in, in, in how that one was dealt with. Um, the IBM Watson for Health, the much heralded, much heralded healthcare system, um, which you know was quite quickly removed because it didn't really work particularly well. It, you know it was basically based on really limited uh, training data. One of the examples was um, the kind of cancer treatment component of the AI. Um, it was based on it was trained on hypothetical cancer cases from a bunch of created by a bunch of uh, you know white male doctors rather than actual real data. So it would often give inappropriate, misleading, and even dangerous recommendations around treatment for cancer. So that one was kind of mismanaged and didn't work particularly well. And then finally, obviously, we've got autonomous vehicles, and there are lots of examples of these where, where the AI hasn't kind of worked pretty well. It's not jointly optimized, and this was a collision where um, a, a pedestrian was actually crossing the road, uh, and the, basically the, the automated vehicle detected the pedestrian, um, the vehicle operator wasn't driving at the time and they were kind of distracted watching a, a, a TV on their mobile phone. Um, the emergency braking system in the vehicle was turned off for a smoother ride. And unfortunately, the vehicle um, hit, hit and killed the pedestrian. So we've got all of these examples where we've kind of been inserting more and more advanced AI into systems. Uh, and we haven't been doing it from a, a HFE perspective. We haven't been doing it from an STS perspective. And for those of you who want to kind of look up, look out for some more of those type of incidents, have a look at the AI incident database. So this is a kind of open database where you can submit AI failures. There's over 2,000 reports of harm in there from AI. And if we look at that, you can start to understand some of the very potential risks that are associated with these. So you can see on the donut there, we've got harm to social or political systems, psychological harm harm to physical health and safety, harm to physical their civil liberties, financial harm, harm to physical property, harm to intangible property, and lots of others. So really a, a kind of diverse set of harms. And what we can see based on what's happened so far is we're really not designing these systems well, and we're not managing the insertion of them into our socio-technical systems. So what we're seeing is happening basically is actually AI is making systems far more complex, brittle, and prone to failure. Um, it's potentially removing meaningful, rewarding, and healthy work. Um, it introduces those kind of interesting issues of skill degradation and situation awareness decrements where we haven't 
designed the interaction. And so there's lots of breakdowns in SA because the humans don't understand what the AI is doing or why it's doing something. Um, it introduces lots of interesting new risks around biases, inequalities, discrimination, uh, as we saw with some of those examples, has a vast range of potential harms. And, and, and as we can see, and as lots of people have commented, HFE typically hasn't been involved or, or hasn't been able to influence enough the design of these systems, which creates uh, a lot of the problems. Um, and so the point of the next few slides of the presentation is, as AI becomes more advanced, these issues are going to become far worse. I mean, they're pretty bad anyway, some of the examples that we've got through. But as we get to artificial general intelligence, the problem is going to become a lot worse. And I'll talk a few in the next few minutes around that and show you some of the work that we're doing in this space. And so what do I mean by artificial general intelligence? So all of those systems that I've talked about so far, what we know, what we refer to as artificial narrow intelligence. So it's artificial intelligence that can outperform humans in specific tasks. So it's, it's, it's an AI that's designed to do one, one specific task. So for example, the Uber Volvo system is to drive a vehicle. We have things that diagnose um, medical um, conditions. We have chess playing AI. If you ask the chess playing AI to drive a vehicle, it can't do it. If you ask the vehicle AI to play chess, it can't do it. It's narrow AI. It can only do one thing really well. Artificial general intelligence is kind of the next iteration of AI that's coming. Uh, some people are arguing that it's getting much closer. Um, and this is where it, it's it, artificial general intelligence. It can really perform a broad set of tasks. It can reason. And more importantly, it can quite quickly advance itself and improve its own capabilities. And it will become as intelligent and if not more intelligent than humans. And so it will be able to do a whole range of tasks, not just the task it was designed to do. And the idea is that once we get artificial general intelligence, because it will be so um, able to rapidly self-improve and learn and you know, digest all the information in the world, we'll quickly then get artificial super intelligence. So this idea that we will have AI that is actually more intelligent and has more capabilities, uh, cognitive capabilities than humans. And so obviously there are some concerns around that. Um, just to kind of flesh out what I mean by AGI, I did the kind of, cliche thing and I asked chat GPT to tell us uh, and it, you know it, it does a good job actually basically development of an AI system that possesses possesses intelligence and cognitive abilities equivalent to those of a human being AGI also aims to create machines that can reason solve problems understand language learn from experience and perform a wide range of tasks so it quite quickly will be able to do other things beyond what it was uh, designed to do um, and so the risks then become really uh, potentially more catastrophic and, and a lot more interesting when we're talking about artificial general intelligence. And interestingly, it's not just the risks where we have an AGI that's programmed to act in a devastated fashion, which is not really what we're talking about today. It's actually the risks that could arise when we have um, an AGI program to do work in some of our systems, programmed to seek beneficial goals, but it develops destructive secondary goals in the process. It starts to develop other goals that aren't aligned with what uh, our goals are. Um, and there's a really good example thought exercise from uh, Bostrom and, and colleagues where they talk about the paperclip maximizer. So this idea that you, if you introduced a, a, an AGI that's whole reason for being was to create uh, paperclips, create and produce paperclips, in, in seeking to do that and seeking to do that extremely well and seeking to get more resources to do that, it could eventually turn uh, the world into a paperclip factory and then the entire universe consuming all resources in the process. Probably not going to happen, but you get the idea. So these, these risks are not around, you know, badly designed AGI or, or, or AGI being used maliciously. It's AGI that's designed quite well, and it's actually doing things really well and seeking to do them even better. And obviously that's when the dystopian views come in, where humans become obsolete and subsequently um, extinct. Um, we wrote a tongue-in-cheek article to kind of communicate this around how you could have an AGI Santa that could actually end up destroying the world. Uh, but on a more serious note, we, we undertook a systematic literature review and said, well, you know, how are people thinking about these risks? Are we using formal methods to identify them? Are we using prospective risk assessment, for example? And what we really found was, no, what, what we've got is a lot of hy uh, you know, hypothetical discussions, a lot of thought exercises. But there's no real kind of formal risk analysis methods being used, the type that we would normally use 
in human factors to look at very complex systems and identify risks. And, and you know, obviously one of the reasons for that is that AGI doesn't exist yet, but that doesn't mean we can't apply them in kind of envisioned world analyses. So what we really don't know a lot about these risks. And the more important point is we don't have the controls necessary to manage them when AGI arrives. Uh, and that's a huge gap in the AI safety literature. Um, and these concerns are really accelerating. So obviously everybody saw chat, uh, chat GPT, which is powered by GPT 3.5. GPT-4 is the next iteration, which is really quite advanced. And the research that they've been doing around that is suggesting uh, that it's a kind of early version of artificial general intelligence. So, you know, three or four years ago, when we used to talk about the risks associated with artificial general intelligence, there was a lot of talk about, well, it's not going to be here for until the end of the century or 2050. We're now seeing signs of it here now with GPT-4. So it's really time to start to think about, you know, seriously implementing controls now and not waiting for it to arrive because, you know, the idea is once it arrives, it will be too late. Um, and so these risks are kind of are being borne out in the area of AI safety. So the Future of Life recently published an open letter requesting that all AGI development programs or giant AI experiments, as they call them, are paused uh, just to give us time to think about those controls and make sure we're, we're ready for these systems. Um, the Center for AI Safety also recently produced a statement on AI risk and asked people to sign this as a, a similar thing. We basically need to uh, think about these risks and do far more work around them. So it, it's really getting quite um, uh, tense in the AI safety world. And uh, there's no doubt that some of these risks are pretty scary. Um, so some of the work we're doing around it is what I want to talk about now. So the first thing that we did is um, we asked a number of HFE people who are working in AI safety programs a set of questions and we published a paper and it's open access and you can find it online. But we basically asked them, what do you think the risks of artificial general intelligence are? Um, how do you think human factors and ergonomics can help in you know, managing and preventing uh, these risks? And what do we need to do as a discipline to actually make sure that we can basically stop humans becoming obsolete because of these systems? And so we asked all these people, we got some really interesting responses. What I'll draw you to in this table, so this is what, are the, what do you think are the risks? So I think seven out of the 10 um, contributors basically said existential threats. So, you know, there's a, a significant concern of people working in AI safety that these things could render humans obsolete and, and basically end the world. Um, may sound fanciful just for some, but there's a lot of, uh, there's increasing discussion around that. And then the second part I wanted to draw you to is that a lot of people said one of the main risks associated here is the replacement of the human workforce. If we're going to get AI that is so advanced and can do multiple tasks, we could be looking at the complete dislocation of the um, work and economic system and, and end up with actually no human work at all. Um, we then asked them, what should HFE be doing about this? How can we, what, what methods would we be using to actually help design safe, ethical, usable AI that doesn't kind of replace entire reams of human work? And the interesting thing here is I won't go through all of the responses, but there was a strong um, theme around socio-technical systems theory being embedded in artificial intelligence development life cycles and also systems HFE. So things like um, cognitive work analysis, event analysis of systemic teamwork, um, network hazard analysis, risk management system, net harms, stamp methods from Nancy Leveson. So there was a real kind of feeling that these socio-technical systems approaches that we use within HFE are, are really needed to kind of make sure that we can create um, safe artificial general intelligence. Um, we've also got a, a bigger project which is looking at um, AGI risk specifically and, and what we're really testing in this project is you know can human factors and ergonomics be prospectively identifying these risks in systems that don't exist yet? So can we actually say now with our methods if we replace human work in this particular domain, these are some of the problems that we're going to face. Um, and so we're looking specifically, uh, we're actually looking at three, but we're looking at two specifically with all our methods. Uh, an executive defense autonomous weapon system, basically an uncrewed combat aerial vehicle system, which has a, a kind of AGI based ground control station and multiple armed um, drones. And then we've also got Milton, um, which is a fully autonomous AGI road transport system. So basically 
an AGI that's been tasked with managing the road transport system in Australia, um, removing road trauma, reducing emissions, stimulating econ economic growth and optimizing journey times. And what we're doing basically is applying all of those systems HFE methods to model what we think those systems would look like. Um, and then we're saying, let's look at what risks can emerge in that system. And then we're looking at current controls and saying, do we have the controls that would be able to manage those risks? And so we're applying stamp work domain analysis, system dynamics, agent-based modeling. We're using structured risk assessment methods like WDA broken nodes, East broken links. And then what we're, the idea is that we will then, based on those analyses, develop and test a set of risk controls by insertion back into our systems models. If we insert these controls, will I be able to manage all of these different risks that will emerge uh, from the introduction of, of AGI? Just to kind of show you a little bit how that works in the interest of time, I'll move through this quickly. So here's a work domain analysis of the executor, which is the uncrewed combat aero vehicle system. Uh, and so what we're doing here, so this is a model of the system. I won't take you through that. We're basically taking each of the functions in the middle level and basically saying, well, what what risks, what are the risks if that function doesn't work very well with the, the AGI? Uh, and you can trace the kind of knock-on effects up through the system onto the values and its functional purposes. Interestingly, what we're also doing is we're turning that green and saying, what happens if the AGI becomes super intelligent and it performs that task? Are there risks associated with that? So it's the kind of, you know, Bostrom paperclip maximizer type thought exercise, but with some kind of, you know, structured methodological rigor underneath it. What happens if that task is performed by a super intelligent agent? Does it create problems in the system? Um, we're also using East and East broken links to look at the risks. Here's, for example, a task network for the executor. Here's a social network. Here's an information network. And what we're doing in here is we're breaking all of the relationships in these networks. So, for example, here we're saying um, what happens if the information around targets isn't passed between the task of confirm and validate targets and the engaged target ta uh, tasks? What, what, is, what happens then? Does the system fall down? Does, does certain risks emerge? So we're doing that for the task network. Uh, and we're also doing that for the social network, saying, what if the same information isn't passed between agents? So what if it isn't passed between the executive AGI control system and its AI drones? And obviously, if it can't tell its AI drones what the targets are accurately, there's going to be kind of problems on the battlefield when it either shoots something wrong or doesn't shoot uh, an intended target. So we've gone through all of these models very systematically. And I think there's... Um, I think there's thousand over a thousand risks that we've identified, but we've we've kind of grouped them into five types, and these are, these become interesting, and one in particular for the future of of work, basically. I think. Um, so the first set is suboptimal performance risks, and this is just where the AGI or the AI is badly designed; it doesn't work properly. An example with the executive system is it has a duff targeting system, so it will miss its tar miss its um, target a lot of the time, and you know we think. Those risks are interesting, but we think current defense capability, HFE life cycle should sort that out. It, you wouldn't expect it to be certified and introduced unless the targeting system worked. I hope not anyway. Um, the second one, and again, more increasingly more interesting, is goal misalignment. So this is the paperclip maximizer stuff. So this is where, um, you know, the AGI, if we think about that work to me analysis, it tries to balance all those different goals and values, um, but it gives kind of, emphasis to some over others. And the obvious example in a defense context is it will give more kind of emphasis to the goal of destroying enemies than to things like rule get aligned with rules of engagement, uh, prevent collateral damage and so on and so forth. So, you know, the, there's, there's some interesting risks there where it's really trying to achieve some of its goals, but it's neglecting some of the other goals. Um, the super intelligence risks, um, this is this is where the AGI becomes really super intelligent beyond the capability of humans. And so it's interesting um, in in a defense context. I don't know if you can hear that drilling. Someone started drilling in the office behind me. Hopefully you can't. And so in the defense context, what you have here is a an AGI that will be able to perceive elements on the battlefield, you know, orders of magnitude quicker than humans, it'll be able to comprehend things much quicker, it'll be able to project. You know thousands of different system states, and the humans just won't be able to keep up with it. So there's there's risks there about whether the humans say, well, you know, 
do we trust the AGI? And we don't know really what it's doing or why it's doing it, but it's been okay so far, so we should just let it go. Or whether they actually rein it in and say, we don't understand how it's getting its situation awareness, so we're not going to let it do anything, which obviously prevents uh, the benefits from having it in the first place. So interesting risks there. The fourth one, though, is more the most relevant to tonight, I think. And so this is what we call enfeeblement risk. So this is where, you know, the it increasingly replaces all of the human roles within the system to a point where the humans become quite redundant and actually the system is entirely dependent on the AGI. And that's really quite interesting, all of those bad effects on the humans, of course, but, but also because if the AGI then does something bad or it fails or it's destroyed, the system then can't revert back to the previous kind of human-centered system and we're stuck with a, a system that can't really perform anymore. And then the final one is over control risks. And that's where basically because the humans control has become scared of the capabilities, they put too many controls on it and it can't do anything. It can't fulfill you know, what it's supposed to do and they don't get any benefits. But as I said, number four is the most interesting one. And, and the Center for AI Safety have talked about this a fair bit, this idea of enfeeblement. I'll just put this up on the slide for you to read a little bit, but this is really what I think the biggest risk that we're talking about in terms of the future of human work and the insertion of really advanced artificial intelligence. Uh, and, you know, you can take this to um, a quite scary conclusion where we really end up replacing a great deal of human work and there's not a lot of interesting, meaningful work left over for us. And we really become obsolete. Um, and one of the kind of thought exercises that we've been doing on the project uh, is the Sorteria AGI, so a third system that we've been thinking about. And this is a, an AGI that's tasked with removing workplace harm, named after the Greek goddess of health and safety. Um, and so we've been thinking about two scenarios, and we've submitted this in a, in a paper, I think, which Andrew is also a co-author on, um, a bigger paper about societal challenges generally. Um, so it's not published yet. Um, but essentially, we have a scenario where Sorteria is designed, implemented, and used in a business-as-usual approach. And we have one where it's designed, implemented, and used based on STS and systems HFE. And we're basically thinking about what kind of the outcomes are in the two different scenarios. And I'll, I'll kind of go through it quite quickly. But scenario one is obviously the dystopian doomsday scenario. So what happened here is um, the, the, the super intelligent AGI quite quickly re realized that vision zero is fanciful. You're never going to get that, uh, particularly with fallible humans working in the system. So it basically decides to replace all human work because that's the only way it can get to its goal of vision zero. Um, it does that, it implements a universal basic income scheme, and then you have all sorts of interesting societal effects where the population starts to lose purpose and meaning. We get addiction, uh, increasing in addiction to social media, alcohol, drugs, porn, because they've really got no meaningful work to do. Uh, and deaths from other sources increase dramatically. And you know the, the scenario goes on to become even more dystopian, but I won't go down that path tonight. But essentially in pursuing its target goal, it's actually causing harm in another way is what the message is there. Um, scenario two, though, with our STS and systems HFE is where great awakening in societal systems thinking happens. And basically the whole thing is driven through STS. So there's a focus on joint optimization. Joint, joint optimization. AI is used as a tool to assist and, and, and create human health and well-being. And essentially what the AGI does here is it creates an army of robots to assist humans in work, not to replace any work. It uses three sets of controls, which I'll talk about in a second. And the result is safe, healthy, meaningful work. It doesn't get to vision zero because no one's ever going to get to vision zero. Don't let them tell you they're going to. Um, but it does kind of create significant benefits in um, health and safety and, and all of the other kind of benefits that go along with that. So that's just some of the work we're doing around more advanced AGI. Um, so the question now, I think, for the last kind of five, seven minutes of slides is, well, what can HFE do about it? So I think at this point, you can clearly understand that I, I'm really against AI replacing human work. There's all sorts of risks. And as AI becomes more advanced, it's just going to become catastrophic. So what can we do about it? And um, what should we be doing about it as a discipline? Um, and so, first of all, I think, um, well, we need to have a seat at the table. So in that same paper that I talked about where we asked experts, we, we asked them, you know, what can HV do about it? I'll run through them in a second. One of the key things that came across, and this has come across in talking to people around AI and AI safety, is 
we're not involved in AI development or AGI development programs anyway, really. We might be in a few places, but HFE doesn't have a seat at the table. So, you know, that's the first thing as a discipline we need to be doing. We need to be recognized that we need to be informing the design of these systems. And I see so many, as a grant reviewer, I see so many proposals where we have technical, very technical proposals with lots of AI experts talking about this super advanced AI system that they're designing, but nothing about how they're going to make sure that it interacts with humans well, that it plays in the socio-technical systems well. So we need to kind of get a seat at the table. And, and how do we do that? And, and a number of the perspectives from the paper we talked about, um, there's a real need for us to better communicate what we do. There isn't enough knowledge in disciplines outside of HFE what we actually do. And we've all laughed about Oh, people just think I design office chairs, but that's a serious issue. We have a definition problem in HFE. There's not enough people in AI safety who know what we do and what we can do and what impact we can have. Um, one of the kind of steps to that, we need to better demonstrate the impact of HFE. I've said this many times, a discussion I had on my sabbatical uh, in Canada, I think it was around healthcare um, and healthcare AGIs. Why aren't we involved? Basically said, well, because we don't believe we, there's no evidence that HFE works. Why would we get you involved in projects if we, there's no evidence to show that your methods work? So we need to communicate our impact and all the success stories of HFE. We need to collaborate with AI developers. There's been lots of discussions about how we don't play nicely with people from other disciplines. Um, and we need to engage with policymakers and end users. We need to be talking to the AI policymakers about the risks from a HFE perspective. Um, we need to be talking to end users about some of the problems they can be bringing into their organizations by inserting AI. I was involved in a project a, a year or so ago where I won't name names, but an organization was fully going steam ahead with inserting AI, replacing uh, control room operators. And they, they had absolutely no idea of some of the risks of that and hadn't even heard of Bainbridge's work and the ironies of automation. So we need to do kind of do that better. Um, and then once we've done that, once people know who we are and what we can do, we need to better embed HFE through AI life cycles. As I said, there's really little evidence to suggest that HFE is being considered across AI life cycles. And when we do that, it's really about applying STS and systems HFE. Um, those controls that I talked about that we've been looking at, so we think there are three sets of controls. There's controls on the autonomous agents designers, so things like design standards, guidelines, codes of practice, laws, rules, and regulations. There's controls into the AI itself, so things like morals, common sense, decision rules, mental models, and so on and so forth. But the third set is really the most interesting to us, and it's controls across the broader socio-technical system. And this is really where we think there's, there are big problems. So these are all of the things that are going to have to change within the socio-technical system to enable the, the, the creation and use of safe, ethical, and usable AI. Laws, rules, and regulations, standards, policies, and procedures in the organizations that are using them, accreditation and licensing, aud audits and inspections, training within the organizations for the people who use them, risk controls, risk assessment. We really believe that organizations and entire systems are not ready for the you know for AI to be replacing human work, and so we, we think that third area of controls is really critical and a, a really uh, critical area for HFE work. How can we actually kind of help with the design lifecycle? So this is from some work that we've been doing in defense around a, an AI target decision support system. This is a real system, not a envisaged system. So this is basically what you see on the slide here is a defense uh, capability lifecycle, very standard capability lifecycle. That's the strategy and concepts, risk mitigation requirements, setting, acquisition and in-service and disposal. And what we've done on it is we've overlaid the activities that we think you need to do to make sure you're going to have safe, ethical and usable AI. And then we've also overlaid the human factors methods that we think you need to be applying at those different steps to actually achieve safe, usable an ethical AGI, AI, sorry. And what you can see really is, you know, we're strongly arguing that HFE needs to be embedded in all steps across that capability lifecycle, whether it's when you're first identifying a capability need, you can be using methods like HTA, allocation of functions analysis, cognitive work analysis, down to acquisition when you're actually getting an AI system and you're testing it and you're doing initial kind of testing experimentation. We need to be using usability, situation awareness assessment, 
workload assessment, um, uh, cognitive task analysis methods. And then when it's in service, we need HFE methods to be doing the operational evaluation, things like assessing human performance when they're using and working with the AI, and also you know, analyzing instance when things go wrong with things like Axima uh, and Stamp. So there's a real need for HFE across that entire life cycle. And this is one example of one we proposed. There needs to be more of them across different domains. Interestingly, the, the color scheme there is around you know, the NATO principles for responsible AI use. So we also map those on to show where they could be kind of assessed through the process. Um, final slide is one we're currently working on. So this is the secure AI framework. So that's safe, ethical, uh, controllable, usable, responsible, and efficient AI. We love our acronyms. So this is basically, again, that kind of socio-technical systems viewpoint. And it's saying, well, what are all of the different factors across a system you should be considering when you're thinking of inserting AI to, for example, replace human work? And you can see there's lots of them. And it goes across societal, international influences, socio-technical system organizational factors, human AI interaction factors and AI factors. And what we're doing with this, and we'll be releasing this as a kind of white paper at the end of the year, we're basically specifying the methods that need to be applied across those different elements to actually make sure that you're kind of aligning with the right principles. Um, another way of looking at it here is just the kind of interaction between those different areas of the system. And the interesting thing here is you can see quite clearly that even if you have a, you know, what you think is a really well-designed AI, um, the other factors are really going to drive and influence how safe, ethical, and usable that is. Um, so it's really a whole of system approach that we're advocating, and very strongly um, STS and systems HFE. Um, I've come to the end of the time, so I'll finish now. So I think what the message is, AI is becoming ubiquitous in everyday life, and more importantly, very <laughs> extremely advanced AI is on its way in the form of AGI. There's all sorts of risks, some of which are existential in nature, um, the really interesting stuff for what we're talking about tonight is the replacement of human work is one risk that's actually unfolding across domains now. It's not something that we're looking to the future and saying, oh, AI is going to replace human work. It's happening now. So it's no longer a question of us saying we don't think it should be happening. It's a question of us as a discipline saying it's happening. Let's, let's basically help make sure that it happens and it happens well and it's safe and everything works well. Um, so I think that's an important point to make. This is not something that we're looking to the future that might happen. It's happening. Um, so we have a critical role to play in managing risks and, and really in making sure that safe, healthy and meaningful work is left over. We don't just want the replacement of work. We want to base, basically those STS principles. And so STS theory and systems HFE are critical if we're going to fulfill this role as a discipline. Um, there's a real need for these applications across AI development life cycles. And I think the pressing challenge is really is to get STS and HFE into those life cycles. Those programs that are developing AI in healthcare and defense, uh, process control, transport, we need to be able to, we need to basically get STS and HFE into those life cycles. And I think I'll stop there uh, for questions. Thank you. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for that. Um, as we predicted beforehand, there, there are lots of questions that have already come up. And I think you're, you're finishing off uh, slides, your second to, second to last slide might be a nice way to sort of step into the first question, uh, which is, uh, will, will AI or AGI actually replace human factors professionals? <laughs> uh, that, that's a really good question. I, I think... I think it certainly could. I think if AGI is realized, there's there's no doubt that it um, probably will. I think the interesting other side of it, though, and, and Peter Hancock talks about this a little bit, is if we do have super intelligent agents and, you know, consciousness is developed in an AI or an AGI, then we're also going to need kind of people like machine psychologists who basically are kind of looking into the heads of the AGI and working out how they work and what's wrong with them and so on and so forth. So there's really, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. I think the answer is yes. Um, okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a scary answer. So thanks, Paul. Um, I, I, uh, this is a, a question from uh, Fergus Bissett. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention the name of the person beforehand. Um, but um, I think you partially answered this, this question, um, but just to make sure. Uh, do we need new tools to communicate or visualize the risks, or do we have those tools already, um, especially in, in addressing some of the, the myths or the, the, the imaginations of, of what AI 
particularly the the more doomsday type AI type, uh, issues. Uh, so, do we do we have those tools, or do we need to develop new tools? That's, that's a really really great question, and we actually did a, a little study, um, Peter Hancock, myself, and Tony Carden, to look at this specifically. So, I think I think my answer there is we have the tools to forecast the risks um, associated with AGI. And I think the project that we're doing kind of is kind of confirming that. Interestingly, though, some of our tools, if we're going to be helping design AGI and advanced AI, I think some of our tools need tweaking. For example, assessments of situation awareness. We're going to have to potentially reconsider what we define as situation awareness and how we measure that in an intelligent agent that isn't human. You know, how do we assess their situation awareness? How do we assess their workload? So I think the conclusion was we have a lot of very applicable methods. Some of them are going to need tweaking. And indeed, some of our theories uh, of performance are going to need tweaking as well. But an example there um, is teamwork. We're, we're basically, we have to redefine teamwork because we can't base our understanding of, of human AI teams on models of human human teams. Uh, so I think there is work for the discipline to kind of extend and advance its methods and theories. It's a great question. Oh, thanks, thanks, Paul. Um, this next question is from from Lauren, um, and I'm hoping you'll be able to um, uh, understand the question because I'm not actually sure what part of it means. But it's uh, the question basically goes this way: What can HF uh, practitioners do try try to do and undertake AGI risk assessments with the aim to reduce black swan events? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so I, I think I think the key is, and, and basically that's what we're trying to do on the project that I mentioned, is we're, we're applying the systems HFE methods to model what we think AGI systems are going to look like. And then we're starting to look at emergent properties in those systems. And I think the systems HFE methods uh, are really suited to that. So things like, um, you know, STAMP STPA is, is very good for that. Uh, the Network Hazard Analysis Risk Management System, NetHarms, uh, East Broker Links, all of those methods where we're describing entire socio-technical systems and all of the interactions, I think, lend themselves to identify some of those black swan type events for sure. Uh, okay, uh, I'm assuming a black swan event is a, a is a is a serious negative event. So am I or? It, yeah, it's like an event that's kind of un unforeseen. We've never thought of before. So okay. kind of complex and new. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, question from Dan, uh, uh, Dan Jenkins. Uh, the trouble with AI development is it seems to be driven by a capitalist model uh, controlled by Smith's invisible hand, um, which means a great deal of money can be, can be made by developing things that are not really wanted or needed. Uh, how do we change that paradigm? Or are we just going to create things that we don't really need? Yeah, trust Dan to uh, ask the difficult question. Um, it's a good question. No, no, it's it, it's a very interesting question. There's a great pod, podcast from Lex Fridman and Max Tegmark talking about this very issue. I think the point with that, as you say, it's going to happen. So I, I think we just, as a discipline, we have to insert ourselves into the discussion to try and make sure that it doesn't end as badly as we think it's going to be. It, the question is right. It's nobody's going to stop because they're so far in the race that it's an arms race there's money to be made by the people who get to the most advanced ai it's not going to stop so it's really about it's kind of damage limitation i guess um the, the, our discipline has a role for damage limitation we need to get involved and kind of sort it out oh, okay so you, you you avoided the capitalist uh, question that's uh, quite a sidestep i'm sure you and dad have discussed this before there's a couple of people that have asked this question um uh, and, and it's really, it goes back to sort of very early in your slide, you talked, to, uh, you gave a statistic, which is that 85 million jobs will be lost, but 97 million jobs will be created, um, which is an interesting, uh, interesting idea and goes against some of the things which, which you say later in your paper. Uh, what are these 97 million jobs that are, that are created and is, is that relevant? Yeah, so that's a that's a really interesting question and a really interesting element of it. So the question there, you know, thinking about STS is, are these new 97 million jobs, are they just kind of supervisory, we're, we're becoming assistant to the AI jobs, uh, which I suspect is the case. So I, I think that's a bit of, um, they're kind of trying to 
prevent the the scare the scariness of the what the the, the report says and that I suspect. Um, so I think the question, yeah, the, are these jobs meaningful? I'm not so sure uh, to be honest. I put that up because I had to. It's in the report, but my I question whether those jobs are actually going to be any better that you know do, do anything better. I think what it really is, it's basically we're we're taking away from meaningful work and we're kind of assistance and thing, you know, checking supervisors, things that we're not very good at, things that are not going to be uh, particularly meaningful for us. Uh, I see there's some comments. Uh, there's a discussion, parallel discussion going on in the in the webinar chat um, about, you know, these jobs might just be created. Uh, are they are they not are they meaningful or not meaningful jobs? Are there, there's a an expletive that's being used there. So I won't repeat that uh, to the live audience. I notice the questions are coming in faster than we can answer them, um, so I'll, I'll I'll try to I'll try to speed up and get to as many of them as I can, um, uh, in the time left available to us. Um, there, uh, 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 two questions from from uh, from Rob Hutton. Um, the one is about uh, what is the state of the art in terms of designing for values, alignments, and ethical decision making. I think you partly answered that in your in your presentation. Um, and, and a related question to that would be, how do we overcome the challenge of ethics is just a nice to have, um, uh, where, where these, these systems are just being developed, but the ethics is, is being thought of in, in, in almost as an afterthought. Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. I'll start with the ethics one. I, I think the challenge with the ethics work and, and part of the project that I talked about that we did on the AI targeting decision support system is, there's also a very, very high level ethical principle documents out there. So, you know, where they say things like um, the AI needs to have governance, it needs to have human centricity, um, it, does, it needs to have no biases, things like that. The problem with those, um, there's no real specific information on how you can assess whether you're aligning with those principles throughout the design life cycle. And that was really one of the drivers for our, the project that we kind of did, where we basically said, well, you could use these HF methods to do that kind of assessment. So I think the ethical one is, is really interesting. There's so many principles out there, but until, you know, until the ethics stuff is, is something that you can actually assess and certify a system on and actually stop a system and say, well, that's not going to be fit for purpose because you haven't met this, met this ethical requirement. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna fail to hit those principles. I think they're too vague. Um, the first question was the state of the art around misalignment and things like that. Uh, again, good question. Hey, Rob. Um, so the interesting thing there is the Center for Risk uh, Center for um, AI Safety released a paper recently um, talking about you know alignment and risks and things like that, and they they they've actually cottoned on to. Kind of Nancy Levison's work and control structures and things like that, um, but but a lot like a one issue they they also had Swiss cheese, so it's kind of like they they're cutting and cutting onto the needs for the kind of things that we do, but they're still you know very much behind in terms of what our state of the art is, and that's part of the reasoning why I was kind of suggesting that we need to communicate better where we are and what we do and what we can do. Um, so I think that I think it is kind of getting into those life cycles a little bit, but it's not our state of the art. I think is a response to that. Yeah, that's a very again that that feeds to a um, parallel discussion going on in the webinar chat about um, the fact that we are not very good at teaching these some, these methods to even to our own students in in HFE. Yeah. Um, uh, this this is this is a very general question. Could go in many different directions. Um, but the the question is: Is the term artificial intelligence misleading? Oh, that's a good that's a good question. <laughs> um, I actually don't know. I I don't think it is. I, I think and I think it, if we if we got to a point where we thought it was misleading, we're, we're in some more problems I think yeah I haven't really thought about that to be honest that question's caught me off guard yeah I mean yeah. I think it's um uh some really general uh well some really uh philosophical questions about uh, about what it, what the first of all what intelligence means and then what the artificial components of intelligence means um yeah so I mean I, I 
in, in a lot of ways, it's uh, they, these systems are designed in such a way that they they designed in a way that simulates how people think. But of course, they are artificial in the sense that we don't necessarily think in that way. We bring in, for example, far more biases as the yeah. training sets show. Um, we just seem to be a lot more aware of our biases by by if, if we watch them closely. I think that's um, fair to say, but I think with AGI, I think it becomes a little bit more, um, you know, we could have intelligence uh, from this. Yeah. yeah. Is, is, the, is the clue here self-awareness? Well, there's a whole debate around what that means. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will. We'll, we'll, uh, I think the answer is we don't really know the answer to that. Um, so, so let me let me skip on to to another question. Uh, this one's from uh, Marilyn De Stefano. Um, in terms of HE, HFE inputs into the life cycle, um, she thinks maybe you've skipped, uh, maybe just jumped over that a little bit. Uh, how can we influence the data that informs the foundation of the algorithms that determine the AI processes? So I think she's speaking speci uh, specifically to the training sets. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really great question, and that's that's certainly not something that we've um, applied HF to in our project. But but I, I'm I'm pretty sure that there there would be methods that we could apply to specify what the features of a you know an optimal training data set would be. You know, you could imagine building um, you know work domain analysis models around you know what what should a a safe, ethical, and usable AI training data set incorporate. So it's not something that we've done specifically in our work, but I, I, I certainly think we, as HFE people, have something to say about that and and methods to help us do that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, uh, a question from uh, Nicole Burks. Um, we assume that human the human purpose is to a large extent driven by work. Uh, do we not need to question that? Is our meaning only derived from 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 work? Yeah, that's a, that's another great question. I think I need some wine for this section. Um, <laughs> look, we do, but I think you know we're we're going on. You know, we're we're basing our our work on STS theory, so we we're kind of strongly committed to the idea that as humans we need meaningful work and we want meaningful work. So I think yeah, that's. I think that is my position as well. I think, you know, in, in the thought exercises when we take um, work away, um, there are, I think, various pathways into which we can, become, you know, lose purpose, lose a bit of meaning. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, this, this, this is a question from Michael Carey, but it also came up in the, in the webinar chat. I see we are uh, we we'll, we are the philosophers when we need them. Is one of the comments coming up. <laughs> please, um, please, please. This this is a, I suppose this is a, a little bit more of a, a direct question, which is saying we, we're not really teaching these tools. Um, so uh, how do we go about making sure that these these tools are, are regularly taught amongst HFE programs, especially given the emphasis in many HFE programs on some of the physical ergonomics aspects. Yeah, great question. And I think it's a huge issue with our discipline, not just thinking about AI, thinking about all areas, really, you know, we're, we're not um, creating the next generation of HFE people, we're not teaching them enough methods. So I, I think that's a big, a bigger picture item about, you know, getting embedded in undergraduate courses, getting more, you know, master's level qualifications and things like that. And, and sadly, that seems to be going the other way, and we seem to be reducing. Uh, the number of courses we have so i think that that is a bigger question for the discipline in that we need to have more um ways of educating the next generation really and also within other courses so not just courses for hfe but actually having hfe you know modules in courses like you know technology development ai development and things like that i think that's, that's that, that would obviously be a good leverage point for us but again it's not something that we're doing particularly well at the moment i don't think um, a question from, uh, and I see we're over time now, so I've only got three questions. So, um, Paula, I don't know if you mind bearing with me. Um, other people are welcome to drop off and, and pick up the, the recording at a later point. So a question from Mark Susan. Um, how do we demonstrate the impact of HFE? Um, I suppose he's talking specifically in, um, in, in AI for this session, uh, but 
Uh, he's more interested in the, in the healthcare sector uh, beyond anecdotal stories. In other words, how do we demonstrate our impact uh, that we can have beyond just showing, for example, what we've done in these good things, which we've done in healthcare and healthcare situations? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. It's a massive challenge. So, you know, a, a personal story here is we got a project funded by the Australian Research Council to do that very thing. Um, and it was obviously going to be a case control study where you had some organisations receiving a HF intervention, some organisations not, and we couldn't get enough people to do it because they said, what's in it for us? Uh, the ones obviously who weren't going to get an intervention. So it's it's extremely challenging about how you do that robustly and, and with enough scientific rigor uh, to produce the results that are valid uh, and you know how you how are we going to get those kind of studies funded um, is really challenging so that again is another huge challenge but but I think um you know there are different ways of assessing things we can have the very rigorous stuff but we can even have um things like organizations where they they're kind of you know assigning things to say that you know we we've actually taken on a HF intervention and we've actually seen a benefit whether you know it's explicitly linked or not I think that stuff is useful um the other stuff we're kind of playing about is computational modeling where we kind of can simulate the likely effective HF interventions and kind of show that hey you would get a benefit in this way. so I think there's various ways I think we've got to be creative um um but yeah again it's very challenging um here's a, here's a question which uh which is related specifically to um, to the educational sector, and, and maybe just as a, a slight aside, I, I noticed it actually when I was submitting a journal article the other day. Um, how best can we ethically, from Manoj uh, uh, Ravindranathan, um, how best can we ethically adopt AGI within within education and still hold on to the the validity and reliability and authenticity of, of, of the content? Uh, and I raised that because I submitted a journal article to a journal the other day, and, and the, one of the questions that asked me is, um, um, did you use uh, did you use an AI generator to generate any or part of this journal article? Um, I, I'd say it's related because it's about generation of content. Yeah. Um, again, that, that is a very interesting question. I actually, um, education is is a really um interesting area in terms of the risks that, that can can arise from inserting advanced AI I think and I was speaking to a few people about this last week um how we do it I think is is kind of a similar message that I've been given we need to have um you know HFE STS embedded right at the start of the development life cycle and all the way throughout the life cycle and that will help us understand the risks and controls my real fear around um the education system in AI is that we we start really to lose the human interaction that is so important in education. You know, we we have increasingly more um, chatbots as assist teaching assistants, and you know, you lose that interaction with the children that, that really is the critical point of the education. So how we how we manage that, I, I don't know because they're obviously pressing ahead with it. But I think in terms of doing it ethically, it's just the kind of things I've been talking about through the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Paul. And um, this is a good question, I think, to to end off. Um, uh, it's from Riza Kazemi. Um, I, I think it it speaks to the AGI and, and the ASI. Um, do you think that artificial intelligence can overcome us and defeat us by reducing our our human cognitive abilities? I'll leave the question there. Um, well, that, that's that, that's a really good question, and I think that's what, in one of those dystopian scenarios where we, where an AGI does remove human work, the need for us to advance our knowledge really kind of drops off. We we lose a need, you know, to educate ourselves because currently we educate ourselves primarily for, to gain work after university. So I think, you know, not intentionally the AGI isn't going to be dumbing us down, but I think the the end result will be that that we kind of you know we we don't advance ourselves it's not dumbing us down i guess it's we're not advancing ourselves so i don't think an agi would do that intentionally but i think a knock-on effect of some of these systems could be that we we kind of lose the will and the capacity to improve our cognitive capabilities if you like um paula i'm, I'm gonna actually stop we've taken a taken it's uh well over our 
our allotted time. Um, I see there's, um, there's a vibrant uh, discussion going on in the, in the webinar chat, um, which uh, unfortunately we're gonna have to bring to a close too. Um, thanks very much to um, some of the people I see from, from, your, own, from your own center. Tony's been uh, rapidly posting bits of information and carrying on with the discussion, as, is, as has Dan. Um, so uh, just up to me to say thank you very much for, a, for an inspiring and, uh, and challenging presentation and to, to all of our uh, participants uh, for, for your challenging questions. We don't have all the answers, uh, and that's what in some ways makes life exciting too. So, Paul, thank you very much, uh, and I uh, hope to see you soon. And thanks very much for, for joining. Yeah, Goodbye. thanks for the invitation, and thanks everybody for joining. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, as uh, just one last thing, um, if you look way up in the chat, you'll see that I posted about the International Ergonomics Association's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, if you just go on to YouTube, if you can't find it, but if you just go on to YouTube and you type International Ergonomics Association, you'll find the YouTube channel. And in a day or so, you will be able to find a copy of Paul's presentation, as well as all the other presentations that the IEA has produced um, over the last year. Uh, good, uh, good morning, good day, good evening to everyone, and thanks, thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone.